Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Film Roundtable. I'm Matthew Wolf, one of the co-founders, and uh, very excited to have as a guest on the show today, the very talented and extremely lovely Polly Morgan. Thanks, Matthew. <laughs> what an intro. <laughs> I mean, I could have gone much longer with that. But, um, like how you're, I think you're the first woman to be a member of the ASC and the BSC, is that right? That's right, yep. That's right. Hopefully that's going to change soon because, you know, we got to like increase the number of women, you know, that are doing it all. So, um, you know, I'm sure it will change soon. But currently, yes, I'm the only woman. It's very cool. It's very cool. I was, um, there's so much to discuss. Uh, you've got such a, a varied career and you've done so much uh, with and so many different kinds of films, which I tried to watch as many as I could in the middle of my crazy work <laughs> and double schedule. But um, I, I kept watching stuff and going, oh, my God, that's so beautiful. That's so cool. And I've got to brush my DP skills up, I think. <laughs> but but there's a, so there's some, it seems like from, there's some similarities in our stories as well, which is kind of cool. So before we started recording, Polly and I were just chatting about traveling and, and being from another country. So um, where, did we, where did we leave off? I can't remember. But um, Well, we like... left off. We're both married to Australians. <laughs> which complicates our lives <laughs> our lives but also enriches it at the same time <laughs> it certainly does yeah I mean you know I guess it's like we're filmmakers so we're nomads at heart really I mean you have to be a nomad don't you to be like you know willing to just travel to all these different places and have your schedule so um challenging and varied all the time so it you know we all, you know, we, we live in a community of diverse people, you know, we've got friends and um, colleagues from all around the world. So I'm sure it makes sense that our spouses are from another part of the world as well. That's so true. That's so true. It's so funny. You, you spend your whole life. I mean, at least I think we, you know, both of us having read up on some of your, your background, but I think we have very similar stories just from where you started. And I'll get into that in a second, but, um, just once you start traveling and you you know you become that nomad it becomes such a way of life and uh you know it's it's hard to kind of adjust things when the family comes along and and the impact that has so um i was actually rather than actually starting what whereas probably i was planning to which was like your career and how you started things we're talking about family i'm intrigued one of the questions i was going to ask you was you know you with your two young kids and uh, the schedule that you've had must have had over the last few years. How, you know, how has that impacted that? I mean, what have you done with the family? Have you taken the kids with you when, when you've been filming? How have you, how have you dealt with that? Yeah, I mean, you know, it was so, um, it was typical, right? Because as soon as I um, booked my first studio movie, you know, like I just booked like, wow, you know, like I'm going to, gonna you know they're giving me this big opportunity I'm gonna go do it and then I think a couple of weeks later I found out I was pregnant and I was like okay it always everything always happens at the same time you know um and so yeah when I did Lucy in the Sky for Fox Searchlight I didn't tell anyone I was pregnant um and it wasn't until I was about to finish like in our last week is that I sort of pulled the producer and director into another room um and I think they thought that I was gonna like get mad with them about something um but they were waiting they was the same producer and director from legion and they were waiting for me to sign on for the next season of legion and um so i pulled them aside and i said oh by the way i want you to know like i'm four months pregnant so yes i want to do legion but i can't do it all and i think i blew their minds and i think you know some people had seen me sit down quite a lot on that movie and they're like why is polly sitting down like what's wrong with her um, and it was only because I used to get these horrible migraines and I couldn't do anything about them. So I was like trying to shoot this movie and like be on top of it all and, you know, hiding the fact that I was like emotional and pregnant. Um, but, and so, yeah, and it just kind of kicked off from there. So um, I had my daughter and then I remember when she was five weeks old, I booked a quiet place too. And then when she was eight weeks old, I had to leave her and go on this director scout which was one of the hardest things I had to do. And I like, I remember rather than taking a flight the day before I took the red eye, red eye to New York because I didn't want to leave her and was trying to pump on the plane. And 
then I got there and I didn't sleep because I'd taken the red eye and then I had to like meet John Krasinski for the first time and be like yo hey yeah I've got my shit together um while I'm pumping in the back of the um the like scout bus you know he was like where's Polly oh she's she's just down the end with a you know rather noisy breast pump um and you know I think that kind of just it kind of just has been like that for the last couple of years like I've just been really fortunate that apart from the pandemic obviously like I've just rolled on um doing one movie after the other and then my second baby came and I went to Louisiana with them when he was um 10 weeks old um and yeah we just all go together and you know we just either find a nanny or take a nanny with us um and my husband's an actor and he will come and then he will usually leave for a bit and then come back um so yeah you know and I was just talking to a director yesterday and she said to me that she took her kids with her the whole time even though when they were in school you know she would pull them out of school and she would take them to Prague or Ireland or whatever um and so it's been it's been great so far I mean it's definitely exhausting um but you know I wouldn't have it any other way yeah so you're coming back at the end of a long shoot day and uh perhaps if I remember I mean my boys are six and eight and um I mean even now the six-year-old still doesn't go through the night without sleep you know like a full night's sleep yeah. So I don't know if that, you know, if that's the case, or like them both being young age, like you're not having full nights sleep, I'm, gu I'm guessing, right? No, I mean, obviously I was breastfeeding in the night on A Quiet Place. And then on right. the core dads, um, my son was, he was next to me in the bassinet and he was a bad sleeper. So he would be up every two hours. And then when I did The Woman King, my daughter had transitioned out of the crib to a bed and so suddenly had this freedom to come into our room and she would come into the room literally like four or five times. And I would always wake up and I would have absolutely no idea where I was. So I'd be like, am I in her bed? Am I in my bed? Um, and, you know, I think there's this thing about like being, feeling guilty about working so hard and being away so much. So when I get home, I'm like, oh, I've got to be super mom. You know, like I can't take the weekend to chill. Um, I got to be like on it and I've got to be, work doubly hard at home because I've been away all week so yeah I mean it's 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 aged me you know <laughs> it's so funny how you sort of call 25 me. but I look you know <laughs> I'm only I'm only 25 myself <laughs> you know I remember I used to look at my friends that I grew up with and I I moved to the states and I was single my friends were married with kids and they they said they, they all look so tired yeah. and older than me and then I've caught them up now you know now that yeah. I've but, um, you know, it's funny. I mean, I've, you know, I, I work mostly in commercials. I have done my, my whole career. And um, so the, the freedom to be around a lot more generally has been the case. And I kind of like pushed long form away a little bit because I didn't want to be away from the family. Yeah. Long periods of time. Like I've, I've dipped in and out of like um, episodic a little bit. And I've got a, I've got a taste of what those long weeks are like and the, the Friday days and and uh, I mean it's hard it's hardcore and um, so I wasn't I felt like my, you know the age my kids were at I didn't want to be away like that although saying that while we're kind of you know uh, transitioning between two countries I you know I spent five months apart from them throughout this whole year yeah. so at various different stages and that's been that's been kind of hard. I've got it is every hard. Time. Every time I go away, they dad, don't leave again. Don't leave. You only just got back. And I was like, oh, oh, me. Well, that's the worst. I know. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I guess that's, that's, that's the life we choose to live, isn't it? I mean, I don't know. It's like to be creative and, you know, like to be creatively like fulfilled and at the same time be emotionally fulfilled from the family side. It's like juggling act. So it's a, it's great yeah. that you can take the, the family with you. Um, I think that's, I'll have to look more into that. Yeah, I mean, you know, I like, of course, it's just going to get more challenging, you know, like your boys are probably in school and they've got their friends and they probably like got out of school activities that they love to go to. And, you know, you don't want to like pull them away from that and then take them somewhere. And then, you know, they feel resentful later on or, you know, it's it's definitely a challenging thing. I mean, I kind of, um, you know, I think about like 
some friends of mine who you know live still back in London and they work in the city you know and they get up at five and they get on a train at six and they get back at like nine and so and they do that day in day out you know so you know I, I feel fortunate that yes we all do work really hard but like you're saying when you do take a bit of time away um, and like I'm doing right now I'm taking you know a couple of months just to spend with the family you know like hopefully they'll remember these times you know and so like the times that you're gone hopefully they forget those and they just remember the memories when you are around um, yeah but yes yeah, it's, it's it's a challenge but I think it's also important for them to see us doing what we love and you know working hard being creative all that type of stuff yeah that's true that's true as hard as it may be you know hopefully gets teaching them some some good things to take yeah. their own lives yeah. um let's uh, let's transition away from family for a second and just um talk about your career um i read i read online that you started as a, as a runner in in production companies in london it's the same as me exactly how i started and uh, oh. uh i was working uh for a production company called Red Wing. I don't know if you I don't know if they were still going when you were there when you were yeah. in London. When Red Wing were they something to do with the BBC? No, no. Yeah, that was Red B actually, I think. Yeah. Red Wing were like on par with RSA. They were one of the top production companies and then they they, they split and they lots of their directors went on to produce, start off their own company, companies like Smile, Gorgeous, I think and Oh yeah. And, uh, but um uh, we probably passed each other on the streets of so maybe. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Uh, there's a story that a funny story that when I actually before I started at Red Wing, I was at college then at the time, and um, I got a job working for as a runner for Rushes. Yes, know, on, yeah, 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 I know Rushes. Yeah. So I started there, I, and I I didn't know what a runner was, and um, you know they'd say you know they'd say okay you got to go out and you got to take lunch orders and bring back whatever people want you know run to get film stock take to the other whatever anyway so as they were getting the orders I would go out and I'd be running through the streets <laughs> of Soho and I'd be coming back sweating and hot and after you know a few days some of the other runners said what are you doing <laughs> what do you mean what am I doing they said you're making us look bad and I said why why this you're running everywhere <laughs> and I said well it's not what we're supposed to do we're runners I mean no no, no, that's not you're not supposed to run you're supposed to be quick but no no you walk safely and you I was like okay got it so that was you did better than me because I would like I would go to drop a package off at rushes or the mill or whatever and I'd pop into a little you know clothing shop on Carnaby Street and be like, oh, <laughs> I, oh god I gotta go you know <laughs> that's funny yeah it was hard being there and all that temptation of all those shops yeah yeah I just remember everyone I, I just thought everyone was so cool you know I just thought god everyone is so cool and then obviously at the end of the day everyone would like hang out in the pubs you know outside on the streets outside the pubs and I was like oh, I can't wait to be older and cool like all these people and now I'm like god are we all that cool or you know maybe we just they were cool back then or maybe it was just all the figment of my imagination they weren't cool at all <laughs> I think every I think when you're aspiring to be something that that it's cool when you're when you're in it and you realize it's just as hard as yeah. everything else yeah but, I mean I I never I never stop being grateful of of you know what what we do and um and the opportunities we have and I think there's definitely you know our jobs are cool yeah but, yeah. but at the same time it's you know it's not a it's not a cakewalk in fact that is, <laughs> you think about the amount of hours we put in yeah yeah, it's not for the faint of heart. You know. <laughs> Definitely not. Um, so uh, let's let's just talk about you know that. So did you about that? What's that? Let's talk about you know your start. So did you always want to be a cinematographer before you got into the film industry? What did you want to? Did you have any idea what you wanted to do? Or because I didn't. So. Well, you know, it's I feel so bored like telling this story again because I feel like I say it all the time. But okay, I was don't tell me. Don't tell me. I'm not. <laughs> So I was just really lucky. I think that, you know, um, so, you know, I'll say that currently I'm a member of the diversity committee at the ASC. And I think what we talk about a lot is like, how can we expose young people to the film business? Like when you're a young kid, you know, maybe from a disadvantaged area or whatever, 
how can you show these kids that filmmaking is a viable career choice for them and it can be vocational and they can work their way up and they can work with their hands or you know whatever like how do we expose them and so for me the real blessing in my life is that um I grew up on a on a farm and when I was a teenager we had this BBC documentary film crew contact my dad and say hey we're coming to shoot this document documentary about Edward Elgar who's a famous composer um he used to roam the fields around your house like we want to use your house as base camp we need some and my dad was like cool yeah and so you know I was exposed to that as a teenager and I and I already had like a love of film and was you know came from a family that um you know we would go to the cinema as like our family outing and it was a big deal and you know I was exposed to art and photography and stuff at a young age so I definitely had that love in me but when I was a teenager just seeing the film crew and like seeing the camera and like you know like sort of talking to the camera assistants and they show me the camera they let me look through the eyepiece like it just kind of you know I knew then that that was what I wanted to do because you know, even though I'm 25, right? Um, but when I was young, there was no internet. There was no way of really understanding when you look at a credit on a film, like what does a best boy do? You know, what are all these weird things? What's a gaffer? What's this, what that, what's that? And um, I think it was always kind of fascinating and we would always laugh about it, like about what these weird jobs were. <laughs> and so to, to get exposure and see a cameraman and a camera and a crew and a crane and kind of be able to piece it together a little bit. I was like, okay, this is what I want to do. And, um, you know, I didn't have any idea how I was supposed to do that. Um, and I think I maybe brought some books or something. And I decided that my, my, the best step forward was to work at a radio station. And then from radio, I could get into TV and then TV, I could get into movies. That was like the path I kind of set for myself. So I worked at Radio Lion, which was the um, hospital radio station at the closest town. Um, I volunteered there. And then from there I went um, and I volunteered at the um, local town's radio station. And that didn't really get me anywhere, but it, you know, it was, it was fun. Um, and then, you know, when I was starting to choose what degree I wanted to do, um, you know, I found like there was a few universities in the UK that did practical camera training and there weren't you know there was obviously the film school there was the northern film school and the national film school but there was no way that I was going to get into any of those so um I went to Leeds University and in Leeds University they did this course which um it was four years and it had it was it was called broadcasting studies it was run in cooperation with the BBC and I had like one year out in the business and uh I had one year of practical training with BBC directors and so, you know, there was sort of like a lot of nonsense I didn't need to learn about, but um, I also got to like learn to use cameras and I got to go and spend a year in the business. And when I went for my year away, I decided to go to Canada and I went to Toronto and I worked for a commercial director there and uh, he took me on film sets and um, yeah. Is that hard to get into Canada at the time? Well, it actually was easy because they have this, cause it was a Commonwealth country they have these like exchange programs like they do with Australia, where if you're under 26, I think, and you want to go and live, work, study there, they'll just give you a visa to do that. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I went there for a year and I loved it. Like, and it was amazing because I just could go. I went on film sets for the first time. Um, I, you know, was like so interested, you know, I would like hang out with electricians and like carry their cable and. I just loved it. I was driving cube vans. I was emptying trash. It was just, it was the, it was the most fun. Um, and then, you know, and so I finished that and then I went to London and I started working as a runner. Got it. Um, so it was just kind of like, it was a long way. I mean, it just took, it was a, just like a journey of however I could try and do it in order to like, you know, get onto film sets. Yeah. Yeah. It's cool. Uh, you know, it's, I, I, I never knew what I wanted to do. Uh, um, I knew that I, you know, like you, I, I went to, I used to go to the cinema when I was young, but we, it was something my brother and I did. We used to go to the Saturday morning matinees. Oh. Uh, and that was like, you get lost in this, this wonderful world of magic, you know, and be yeah. transported. Yeah. Uh, 
and I always knew that that gave me a feeling of like you know like something I never had you know like of, of being alive that was you know I didn't really get anywhere else you know in kind of entertainment not from TV but you know that was just the magic of being transported you go into the cinema and the film would come on but it, you know for um I I remember like I got into college I I, I screwed up my my A levels and I I knew I wanted to go to college so I went to London and to like city of London poly it was called at the time and uh to study geography just so I could get in to college to do anything and yeah. I showed up on the first day and I realized it was a modular degree so whatever you showed up whatever course you showed up for on the day you could register and do that so I, I kind of got out I didn't even do geography I went straight into psychology and oh. uh, and uh whenever I used to tell people I'm studying psychology they go oh well, what am I thinking now <laughs> I don't know <laughs> but, the British sense of humor <laughs> <laughs> so uh but I, I realized there was a lot of stats in there and it wasn't really my thing. And I managed to kind of transition into communication studies. And then, you know, I was like, oh, wait, this is, and start learning about film. And they're like, oh, this is cool. Yeah. Um, and then I, 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 this is not about me, it's about you, but so I'm going to whiz forward. But I, I eventually I got, I got a scholarship to go to film school, to London Film School, London International Film yeah, School. Yeah, great. That's such a good school. Uh, it was, it was great. And um, I managed to, with my with my way in one of only two scholarships they gave out to somebody from Essex, like Essex scholarships, and um, it was funny because I hadn't applied anywhere, but it was it was the recession, and and so I you know uh, I went for this interview, and um, they called me up a few months later. They said, "How's your application with film school going?" And I hadn't applied, and I said, "You know, I haven't heard from anyone." I was like, "I don't know what's going on." It's like so frustrating, and uh, they said, "Well, maybe it'll help if you tell them you got the scholarship." And I was like, "Oh." So I jumped on the phone straight away and started calling around the Amazing. film school. <laughs> and I got into London International Film School. But um, it wasn't, and I was actually going to leave after the first term, I was going to leave and become a full-time like freelancer, runner in commercials. And, um, but when I got behind a 35 mil camera for the first time and, you know, the film was going through the gate and, and, and I was looking through and I was like, I got this kind of like quickening of my heartbeat. And I was like, whoa, yeah. this this is magical. It, it was magical. So at that point, that was when I knew I wanted to, I wanted to go into the business and then into the, you know, into the, become a DP. But um, I was in my mid twenties. I mean, I mean, of course I'm <laughs> my, my mid teens, <laughs> but you know, yeah. So, um, so it's just funny how things work out. So I wanted to ask you now, obviously you've been doing this for quite a while. Um, how would you say that if at all your approach has changed? From when you started to where you are now because obviously uh, and i want to talk about individual films along the way but uh i mean maybe we'll start off with the woman king because that's that's the most recent project that's out now i know you've worked on another project you were telling me before but um let's talk about the woman king was that the biggest film that you've done to date yeah i mean you know biggest i think definitely you know i mean i guess budget wise it's kind of in a similar place to a quiet place too um, but biggest in scale, yes, definitely. Um, yeah. <laughs> Did you feel overwhelmed at any point? Did you ever think like, shit, this is like, how do I deal with something this big? Or, you know, had, had the progression of how your career has gone, like prepared you for, for something of this scale? I think, I think the progression just kind of prepared me. You know, I think I'd never felt uncomfortable. Um, I think... I have felt uncomfortable in, you know, previous moments, but on that movie, I never felt uncomfortable. And I think one of the reasons was, was that from finishing Where the Cruel Dad Sing, I had like three days before I went on a plane to South Africa initially. And I think, um, you know, which was a killer, but um, I think just rolling on from that movie, which had so many challenges, especially being, you know, largely day exterior in that kind of environment and then going to do the woman king which was challenging in the same way um I felt very prepared you know and I'd learned so much on that movie and you know and I think you know it, it just was bigger in the fact for me what was which was challenging about it was obviously the action was something that I was a little bit new to or it was like a different type of action um, but also just the multiple cameras, you know, like Gina told me when I first met with her that she liked using multiple cameras. Um, and where the core dad's saying, you know, I use one camera, 
I would send my B camera to go shoot beauty shots of the marsh and I would have this luxury of just you know photographing with one camera and it was glorious and now I had to shoot with three or maybe four or maybe five and so it was just a different role to take on you know it was just kind of like a you know like directing traffic in a way you know just trying to make sure that all the shots worked and looked good and dealing with such large crews and um, dealing with a second unit, like a full second unit that I hadn't done before, um, a big rigging crews, you know, so it was really more to do with a larger scale of people management, I suppose. Um, but really, you know, when it comes down to it in a way, like the job is always kind of the same, um, yeah. you know, just to make sure that Gina and I were really on the same page and we both, you know, were focused and knew what was going on because, you know, it was very challenging, the movie, in that it, we had 58 days to shoot it in. Um, and it was fast, you know, it was like big. And there was a lot of actors, you know, like ensemble cast, all these women, um, lots of backgrounds, you know, huge sets to light, like whether it was the palace, which is, you know, it was just, Akeem McKenzie did the most amazing job, like incredible building this kingdom. And, you know, I remember just being so overwhelmed the first time I walked into it was just, it just had such energy and power and it was so exciting, but also it's like, oh, holy fuck, like this square is ginormous. And then the barracks were over there and, you know, it was, it was huge. And, you know, it was just kind of the scale of things that um, you just had to wrap your head around a bit, but, you know, like I said, it's kind of the creative part of it is almost the easy part. It's it's the politics and the people management and this changing schedule and, and all of that that gets more complicated. That was, I, I went to the cinema last week. Where was I? Uh, oh, oh, I was I was in New York. I was in New York and uh, I had some time and I, I thought, okay, in trying to see as many of your films as I could. And it was great. There was... It was great to to see the Woman King in the in the cinema, and uh, it was amazing. I mean, it had me tearing up at the end. By the way, good. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I got emotional. Um, when I, you know, I was interested. Uh, you know, like um, the blood ceremony. You know, like um, do you remember the blood ceremony? Yes, of course. Some so of what, my favorite scenes, actually. Really, that's cool. Yeah. So, how, is that even? Do you remember like how you went approach? What was your approach for that scene and how you went about lighting it and stuff like that? Yeah, I mean, it was funny because, um, you know, in 1823 in Africa, there's not many light sources. So, you know, really at nighttime, you know, we got the moon and we got the fire um, and just trying to like play the balance, you know, of the color, you know, what's the, um, you know, what's the strongest color, you know, what's the key, what's the fill, how do we, you know, play the ratios? How cool is the moonlight or how, you know, or is it just ambient light? No. And I think, you know, for the, for the, you know, the blood ceremony, we just felt like it should be warmer. And so it's different in that the moonlight is not the overpowering source. It's actually the fire, you know, the fire and the blood. And so everything is warmer and richer. Um, I mean, really on that set, we would, and pretty much all our night work is that we built these big moon boxes. Um, and we had these lights, which I hadn't used before called film gear Helios lights, which I don't wait, know if they- Oh wait, I know, the, I know the Astera Helios, but that's- the Yeah, the no, it's the different. Helios. Yeah, it's weird why they call them the same name, but the, the Helios film gear lights is they're like a Dino somehow, mm. is that they're actually a circular fixture and they've got different heads within it. Oh, and um, you can direct them? Yeah, like they're, you know, completely LED, you know, con remote controllable. Um, and they've got a lot of punch to them. So we use those a lot. Um, and so we would have all these different moon boxes surrounding the set. And then obviously we would, you know, have light from the floor also. Um, but we'd always have this like base layer. And I think for Blood of the Sisters, we just kind of like, we really warmed up you know, the moonlight sort of ambient fill from above. We just wanted to just lean into the richness of the fire for that scene. So they, were those moon boxes like going through, like those lights going through diffusion, that hence the boxes, like you like you had a few of them behind like a built box of 
Yeah, so we basically built different size truss rigs, you know, yeah. like, um, and sometimes we would have like 12 lights on a rig or eight lights. Um, and then we would have like, I mean, you've never seen so many cranes, like we would have large construction cranes with the big boxes on and then we would have condors and then we would have smaller like, you know, manitous or petty bones or whatever. Um, so it was, a, it was a crane party. Like we just basically <laughs> surrounded the whole kingdom with these cranes because we didn't have time to move them. So you um, just switch on and off whichever direction you were shooting in basically. Exactly, yeah. So we would, you know, just backlight everybody and then we would just, you know, key from the floor. Got it. Um, but I do remember like that scene, even like the battle dance scene, you know, like we would only have a few hours to shoot it. So it was like, um, you know, we just would have multiple cameras and, you know, I just remember it being such a like, it was just such a fight because a lot of the sisters, you know, I'd have one sort of steady cam doing the like move up from the bowl to the arm and the knife. And then the other camera would be like over here on a dolly and then the other camera would be like on a long lens. And it was just trying to make sure that we got all the pieces and covered all the, you know, relevant actors and, you know, then could move on. Um, and then we would be pre-lighting like another part of the kingdom um, so that we could just literally roll DIT and sound over and, you know, the camera carts and we'd be kind of ready to go. So um, it was always just a race at the clock. But I mean, when is it not, you know? That's true. Did you, how many takes of that did you have then? Are you just like one take, shoot as much as you can or you had a few takes? Yeah, I mean, Jean is quite good. I think when she knows that she's got it, she'll just move on. Um, I always like if she does one take or if any director does one take, I'm like, let's just do one more. Sure. Yeah. You know, I'm like, oh, I don't want it to be out of focus and you get yeah. it or whatever. <laughs> um, so, yeah. And then, you know, if she doesn't have it, she always says, you know, she would just say, like, if I don't have it now, I'm not going to have it in the edit. So I've got to make sure that I get it. Um, and so I don't know, but we, we weren't gluttonous on the takes at all. You know, we just kind of like had to be quick. Cool. Yeah. Um, uh, you actually said something um, about DIT, uh, you know, how do you normally, what do you normally do with your DIT? Are you normally create, trying to, like when you go into a project like this or any project, are you trying to create a look in advance and you, and you know, and you know, and is that, this actually leads me to a different question, you know, in terms of your, your creative arc from a lighting and camera and color perspective. Um, you know, or you like, you're just making sure you've got everything on set and then you're going into post and you're like, you're, you're dialing it in in post because obviously you know what you're doing in, in terms of, yeah, does that make sense? Well, yeah, yeah, it makes perfect sense. I mean, my approach with the DIT has been inherited from my independent movie days where um, I can't remember what it was called now, but we didn't have DITs, but I would like, I would go, I would go meet Steve Yedlin for a yeah. cocktail <laughs> uh, and Steve Yedlin would build me a lot because obviously Steve Yedlin's like a genius and um so he would build me I was kind of talk to him about whatever indie movie I was doing and he would build me a lot and then we would get that box whatever that box would called and we would we would put the lot through the box on the monitor right okay. and so um my indie movie days like there was no DIT but I would create a look for the dailies because there's no dailies colorist right so yeah. whatever the dailies would be or they would edit with um would be created through this lot that steve would make for me and um i just lit to that you know um and of course it was always kind of rough and a bit shaky at times but that's just my approach and i wouldn't do multiple lots i would just do one for everything um and that's still very much my approach today like um, I'll talk to my colorist um, ahead of time about the movie. Um, I'll share with them um, my references of, you know, the feel and look of the film. And then they'll create a lot for me, which then I will take to the camera tests. And then I will use that for the camera tests. And then usually they will tweak it for me. And then I'll use it for the hair and makeup tests, which usually come after the camera tests. Um, and then hopefully they get a chance to tweak it for me again if they need to. Um, and then kind of off we go. And um, I have to say, so when I did A Quiet Place 2, which was on film, um, you know, I got kind of like very much into the fact that I wasn't in the DIT tent. 
um, I was just on set with this terrible like HD tap iPad thing and uh, just got very used to lighting with my meter and it was amazingly freeing. Um, and then when I did uh, Where the Cool Dad Sing, because it was one camera um, and because I was working with Mitch Dubin, who was operating with me, who is fantastic, um, but really likes to be very much involved in the conversation with the director, is that I really felt that I didn't want to be away from that conversation because otherwise things would go in a certain direction, which I didn't want them to. <laughs> so um, I had to really be on set. So, you know, people would laugh at me because I was like running around all over the place and that I would like be on set. And then just before we'd roll, I'd run back to the DIT and then, um, you know, sort of like maybe watch the take at DIT. And then as soon as they call cut, I would be back on the set. And, um, you know, I think it was kind of a little bit you know, the DIT would keep offering up CDLs and stuff. And like, can you do, can I, what about this? What about this? And I'd be like, no, I kind of just prefer it how it was. And so I just didn't really do much at all um, on where the cool dad's saying, I just did it all, you know, um, with the lighting. But when I worked on the Woman King, you know, like Walter Volpato that did the um, DI for us at Company 3, I kind of purposely asked him to create a LUT that was, darker you know that it was like a little bit more crunchy so because I was working with dark skin tones there was a lot of night work I really just wanted to like help myself get a thicker negative you know by like just over lighting it at times yeah. and um it was so heavy that often we just had to be like we had to cheat a little bit and just be like well, let's just oh, you know the gap would be like oh, I've got no more light like it's too dark and we'd be like okay let's just open it up a bit um, but Nigel Tompkins, my DIT in South Africa, he was really amazing just with um, skin tones and just balancing stuff out a little bit. Um, so I probably used him more than I have used the DIT in the past. Um, but again, it's that same kind of approach um, where it's just like I kind of use my LUT as a film stock and yeah. then that's just my base. Yeah. And I think it's super important to make the dailies you know, you don't want to leave everything up to the DI because everybody sits with this material for like half a year and everybody loves their movie. And then you get into the DI and you start changing things and people get a bit upset. Yeah. So um, you've got to try and just make sure that the dailies are kind of close to where you kind of imagine the M film to be. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so uh, was that the first time going back to um, Quiet Place? Or was that the first time you shot on film for a while? Yeah, the time before, the last time I'd shot on film was when I did additional photography on American Horror Story, um, which was shortly after leaving AFI and I was like petrified because um, I was given that job and I was like, oh God, uh, am I gonna underexpose this because it's a dark <laughs> movie show? Um, but somehow I never managed to. Um, but yeah, I was, I was petrified for sure um, to like get back, but I loved it, you know, and I think, it's amazing how brave you get just after like a week or two. You're like, yeah, it says 0.5, but there's loads there. Yeah. <laughs> I always, I still, I still pull out my meters probably 90% of the time. And sometimes people as a director that I, I work with every now and again, and it, he goes, oh, Wolfie, he goes, it's so cute <laughs> to see you with your light meters. It's so cute. And I was like, well, just, it's nice to be able to talk to the gaffer and the grip in terms of stops, you know, like, yeah, yeah. so, and that's kind of what, you know, when you grow up with that, I mean, I use, I do use force color a lot more than other than I, than I ever used to when, you know, was shooting digital, but, um, uh, I did, a, I worked a second unit on a, on a, an HBO show a few years ago, like three years ago. Um, and it was all shot on 35 mil. And, um, it was the first time I'd shot on film for 10 years. Uh, actually about, 2011 was the last time I shot three 35 mil commercials. And uh, I was like, <laughs> okay, now I've got to think, you know, <laughs> so, but it was, it was great. Like you said, it's, yeah. it's, I know it's, I know it's films making a comeback. I mean, there's some, there's a young D, DP that who uh, was part of an electric cr crew on a short film I did a couple of years ago. And she's like gangbusters. Every time she's posting something on, uh, on Instagram, it's, 16 mil here and 16 mil there and I said that's so good to see you bringing film back and a lot of a lot of people are doing that now I think yeah yeah I mean you know you just got to try and get like the producers on your side right 
Um, but I mean, what's hard is just the labs, you know, like there's so few labs everywhere that it's just, it's challenging. I mean, when we did a quiet place, we wouldn't see the dailies. We would have to ship them. So they would go from Buffalo and they would make a connecting flight and then they would get to LA and then um, they would have to put it in the bath and then they would have to send it to company three from Photochem. And so we wouldn't really get like, we wouldn't be able to see anything for like three days. Um, and I wouldn't be able to get like a report from the lab for like two days. I mean, often they would like miss the connecting flight or, and it was hard. I mean, it was hard, not necessary for lighting, but I think, you know, the style in which we shot that movie was very much sort of like, um, you know, John would be inspired to be like, oh, actually let's just shoot this. And, you know, oh, can we just quickly do this and grab this? And, you know, uh, Steve um, Cuervo, my focus puller did such an incredible job, but like there was not time for marks or anything like that. So, you know, you're shooting a horror movie, which is very dark on 35 mil, wide open, anamorphic, you know, it's, and then three days later you realize that maybe, you know, somebody's out of focus is, <laughs> It's tricky. Um, so, what yeah, it's, it's a little nerve wracking. What, what lenses do you shoot that film on? I shot T series anamorphic. So, how fast are they? They are, they're like one nines, I think. Are they really? Okay. Yeah. So, wow. So, well, they're like twos, twos, one nine twos. I haven't shot on the T series. I've shot on the C, C series a couple of times before. But, uh, yeah. Well, the T series, the T series. What I've done, because I shot with the T-Series also on The Woman King, is, you know, what I've done is actually Dan Sasaki has kind of like, you know, gone in and made them look like the Cs, but you can shoot them wide open and they don't fall apart. And also their close focus is really great. Oh. I'm actually lying to you. They're not one nines, they're two eights, but you can shoot them wide open. I was going to say one nine is fast for, for an animal. An animal effect, yeah. Yeah. Getting a bit oh. mixed up there. <laughs> That's all good. That's all good. Um, let's let's. You mentioned um, in one of your films earlier. Uh, I think it was your first studio, Lucy in the Sky. Yes, I, I love that film. I mean, I I'd never seen it before, and I, when I watched it, I mean, uh, it was first of all I thought it was really well acted, and then it just looked so beautiful. I mean, I've got a few questions about that, but it's um, didn't do that well, right? It, it, it terribly, seemed... <laughs> terribly. <laughs> Yeah. Sure. Well, you know, it's an interesting thing because I guess I learned a lesson in that is that, um, you know, if you do a studio movie and the studio aren't behind it, nobody's going to see it because oh. really like, you know, that's the thing that's difficult about indie movies or whatever is like you really need some money to help like do the P&R, right? You have to get people to be aware of your film and yep. if no one's aware of it, no one's going to see it. So you know, you're kind of fighting a losing battle. So Lucy in the Sky, you know, there was some disagreement in post between Noah and the studio. And I think that it didn't get great reviews when it went to TIFF. Mm -hmm. And then it kind of just died a death until I think it was put on HBO. Um, so nobody saw it and it was sad. And I think that's that thing that makes me so happy about The Woman King, you know, is that, you know, we all work really, really hard and not just us as DPs, but all of the crew, you know, yeah all of the electricians and the PAs and the craft service and everybody. And so they want to see their hard work, you know, be appreciated. 100%. Um, and so Lucy in the Sky, it was, it was sad when people didn't see it because I, I, I like that movie also. What, just talking creatively about that, you had all these different film ratios, like these framing ratios and it looked, looked, looked like it was changing in shots. Sometimes like you had the, the cropping the crop was 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 adjusting in certain shots yes um and you know you shot on different lenses i could see that so what was wh whose whose idea was that and what you know what, what was the <laughs> what made the decisions of when to do when to when to make go wide or when to box you in and, you yeah know. well you know like so obviously noah hawley is the showrunner and creator of legion and yeah. also fargo um, but he, you know, that was his directorial debut. And so, you know, Noah has an incredible mind. And so um, it was always going to be unique in its visual approach because he's just that type of director, you know, like, and, and writer, you know, when you watch a show like Legion, so much of that 
comes from his creative brain and it's very out there. Um, and when I first read the script, it definitely had the aspect ratio shifts within it. And mm -hmm. the whole like, um, you know, purpose was it, was that, you know, she was up in space, you know, she, she goes up as an astronaut and she sees the world beneath her and it changes her forever. And so, you know, when she's up in space, her world opens up and it's very expansive. And yet when she comes back to earth, you know, she feels claustrophobic and she's not connected to her life. Yeah. Um, and so it's kind of dealing with the sort of, not PTSD, but the sort of her emotional state and, you know, her, her sort of feelings of being back on earth and how to connect with her reality again. So, um, you know, we used the aspect ratio as a creative tool to kind of illustrate her, her mental state. So you, but you shot on different lenses as well, right? You shot on anamorphic and spherical, I think, is that right? Yeah, yeah. So um, it was actually very complicated because <laughs> uh, <laughs> it was more complicated than it honestly needed to be. But so we shot on, um, we shot on anamorphic lenses um, and because we shot on anamorphic lenses and we needed to take a four, three aspect ratio extraction out of that anamorphic capture, we needed to shoot on an 8K camera. And um, at that time, I feel like RED and the DXL were yeah, like the yeah. only cameras that we could really have shot on. Yeah. So we shot on the DXL um, and we used, we also did, we didn't just do um, 240 and 4 by 3 We also did a variety of different aspect ratios, but we did one where it was like super skinny. It was, yeah, yeah, I yeah, can't remember what that was. It was um, what they said the aspect ratio ended up being, but we ended up shooting different plates and then the visual effects department would stitch those plates together. And, oh. then, and then she would be, she couldn't cross the plates, but she could be within one of them. Um, and then even in one of those plates, I think it was in the bowling alley, it went from like super, super skinny. And then we pushed in through that and it became, you know, the full frame. Yeah, um, and so we shot those plates on spherical lenses just for the visual effects so that they could stitch them together without the anamorphic distortion. Oh, I see. You'd have a larger yeah. coverage. Um, yeah. And, you know, like, but there were, there, we used some funky lenses in there too, like yeah. that um, Petsful lens. We used that for like... What, what lens? The, the Petsful, is that what it's called? You know, I think a Chase Owen just used it on Blonde. It's where like the leaves and everything go super swirly. Is that a Panavision lens? You know what? It was actually a Claremont lens, I think, or it was a still lens that was kind of discovered and brought into, you know, motion picture. Right. So I, I don't know whether Panavision have kind of copied it and made one of their own, but I remember like Keslo kind of took it from Claremont and, you know. I did. I did some tests a few years ago. I was shooting in, in New Orleans for a couple of years, like every few months for this series of commercials. And so Panavision was like the main house and I kept every time I did another round of this commercial, I'd try some different lenses. And right. uh, I, remember, I remember doing, uh, it was fun, I remember testing out the portrait lenses. Yeah. Mean, yes. So funky. I was like, yeah. you know, we, we're going to use these portrait lenses before I'd actually tested them. And I tested them out down there. I was like, oh no, we can't use these on a commercial, but uh, put them in the bank for like something, some kind of strange visual effects. When... Yeah, well, you can't frame the, you know, you have to like basically center punch everyone because it's just, you know, it's just like, you know, falls off so badly on the edges. 100%, yeah. <laughs> it was, no, it was, it was, it was beautiful. Yeah, it was, Um. yeah, I liked, yeah, well done for yeah. that. Yeah, uh, I mean, we, we just, you know, we went there and he was just kind of a director that, really wanted to go there. And so it was a lot of fun to just, you know, figure out like visually, it wasn't just, you know, it wasn't style over substance. It was like visually, how do we portray this woman's mental state here and there? And I remember when we were doing the end scene in the parking garage. Oh, that was one of the questions. So well, <laughs> yeah. is we were shooting it. And then I think Noah was like, oh, let's, let's put some Vaseline on the lens. And oh, I was, like, I was gonna say, what was okay, that? Yeah. <laughs> and then he's like, oh, let's put more on. Oh, let's put more on. And I think we had Jeff Haley come in from the day, who's like, you know, obviously incredible steady cam operator. And he did all that work. Um, I think he'd just come off a night shoot. I don't even know what was a crazy, I don't know what was going, it was pretty crazy. But like we just put so much Vaseline and we just built it up and built it up. The more like just you know, like unhinged she yeah. became, we just put more and more Vaseline on it. <laughs> 
No, on on a on like a, an optical flat or on yeah, the yeah, yeah, probably yeah, yeah. I wasn't the one putting it on, but I'm sure. <laughs> and then um, the, like the stars, the shooting stars, like was that post? I mean, you we did that in post and marry the two. I'm assuming, right? Yes. Yeah. And, yeah. I mean, God, it's so funny, isn't it? It's like you work on these films and then people ask you questions like years later, and you're like, I did, did I do that? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I was wondering about that. It is hard to remember stuff. I I think to myself, I I, I worked on this job. This is, I worked on this job in Chicago a few years ago and it was, um, it was a mix of live action and tabletop and, and it was like some heavy tabletop stuff. And uh, um, the gaffer was an old school gaffer. And he said, I think I guess, I've done a shot like this before. I was like, really? He goes, let, let me look back in my notes. And he emailed me the notes and he, right, for the last 20 years, he's kept notes. He's got this format, page format with, with steel frames, which he took from the film, you know, the video tap from shooting film. What? And he and he's got so because I remember you used to be able to get someone to like the script supervisor to print you out those. Um yeah. somehow he's like he's married them into his notes oh. and and he's got a lighting diagram of every shot, what the lights are, what the stop was, what the frame rate was, what the lens was, what the stock. I mean, it was insane. I was thinking to myself over and over again, I must do a better job of keeping a, like a table of everything I use on certain jobs just so I can refer back to things but oh you know what though like so I came to America to go to AFI yeah and uh you know it actually took me a few years to come here because the first time I applied I got in but I couldn't afford to come so I had to like uh, not make it um and I, I eventually figured out how to pay for it and I came back and then in my summer I was just like oh I gotta I gotta work I gotta you know earn some money and I'm not going to bore you with the story, but I managed to get a job on Inception with Wally Pfister. And, um, you know, I had come, I had been a camera assistant, but I wasn't a camera assistant on that. I was just Wally Pfister's assistant. And I can't remember if he asked me to do it or if I was just kind of bored. And so I decided to do it myself. But like, I like use Photoshop and I made like a lighting diagram for every single scene in that movie. Like I would talk to Corey the gaffer and, Ray, and I'd be like, this is the light, this is the gel, this is the stop. You know, and I did this thing. And then I remember I was on, a, I was shooting a movie and an electrician asked to borrow it. This guy, Derek, I know Derek. And, and he fucking lost it. And I'm like, no. I, don't know, I don't know where the file is now. It's like somewhere on a hard drive or whatever. And I'm like, oh, I could really use that right now. <laughs> I was like, oh, can you send that to me? I'd love to see yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Um, um, but yeah, I did do that. And that was just honestly such an amazing learning yeah. experience you know and also we would go to like watch dailies in a lock pro which is like a portable projection screen you know and you would go and you would sit in it and you would watch the projected dailies and so doing that and writing all the um the, making the diagrams and taking the notes and then watching the dailies I mean like that for me was like the best education ever God, right? incredible yeah. incredible Actually, that, that so that leads me to a question that's like you obviously work with a lot of DPs, like as you were coming up, you know, would you say that you've was one Would there, is there one DP more than another that's influenced your approach or style, or is it an amalgamation of everything, you know, you know that was good from him or that was good from her? Or, yeah, know. I mean, I think it's an amalgamation. I mean, I think when I was in England working as a camera assistant, you know, especially when you're a second, you're so busy. You know, like I used to work as a second. I used to think everybody knew how difficult my job was. And then it wasn't until I started shooting. I was like, no one fucking cares. <laughs> oh, a second AC's job is. And nor do they even know. But, you know, like lifting the huge lens cases and the heavy batteries and all that stuff, like film cameras, running the mags, like all of that stuff. Um, but no, like I am sad. Like I remember when I was working as an assistant, you know, like, the, the DPs would have the, their box of filters that they all owned and, you know, you yeah. have like tobaccos and your antique suede and all, all of right. those. Yeah. And uh, I always remember, oh, I would like look at on the monitor and I'd be like, wow, that looks so cool. How does that look so cool? And it would be like, you know, they'd slap on an antique suede and, you know, you'd be done. So I'm kind of sad about that. But I think, you know, everybody that I got to work with kind of like, kind of took something from them but it wasn't necessarily how to light or how to work you know yeah. I mean like Alvin Kuchler that I was just texting with last night like he's just such a joy to have on set you know he's just never takes himself too seriously and he's so talented and I think I like 
try to like emulate him sometimes you know I mean he's he's just got such a wacky sense of humor being German but um it's not as good as mine but <laughs> um you know and then Harris Sambalukas who I work with a lot like I owe him so much he really went out of his way to teach me um he's just such a calm presence on set you know mm -hmm. and so thoughtful but you know I think obviously that experience on Inception because I wasn't a second because I wasn't so distracted with trying to like take care of the focus puller and actually do my job as a second. It was just really like an amazing education. And I think that that's what I've said to other young people coming up. Like if you can get on a movie, you know, like you said, oh, I need to, I wish I could take those notes. Well, you can't take those notes because you're too busy. But there are jobs now where if there is a big movie, like the production will let the DP have an assistant. Amazing. Um, and they think they get, you know, I got paid the same as a PA. Um, and so that was for me, just like an incredible learning experience just for lighting. Cause I kind of always kind of knew cameras, you know, instinctively just kind of knew, especially being an assistant, but um, the lighting definitely just, that was a great education for me. Yeah. Um, that's cool. I, I, I have, you know, at times had people like gaffers and I'll say, can you make notes because so we, in case we can want to go back or to things, but also just because when I actually do remember to ask somebody to make a note, if I, cause you've got too much going on in your own head to kind of to yeah. take the time when you're on set, I feel like, but um, um, what, um, one, thing, one, one of the things I wanted to ask is like, just for people coming up and learning um, your approach, like when you first, like from your in, from the interview process to like being on set and shooting, so let's you know if, if you don't mind sharing, what's what's your you now let's let's talk about you know an, the interview. Like let's say I'm assuming your agents probably now you know your name your name's going around and you know you're already in the hat. I'm, I'm I'm sure people directors you work for are asking you to work for them again. So there's that. But what about new opportunities? You know, like will an agent say, "Hey, read this script. I think this is really cool." you know, and you'll read it, you go, I, I must, I want to shoot that, you know, what happens? Well, I mean, you know, this is going to be a long-winded answer, right, but um, <laughs> I just spoke to a friend of mine who's a DP the other day, and they were asking me, they're like, you know, what does your agent do for you, because, you know, I'm not sure whether I should change agents, you know, I'm stagnant, you know, la, la, la. Um, and everybody that I speak to sort of says, um, oh, I just always work with the same people, my agent doesn't really do that much for me. And I said, um, actually, that's not at all um, what happens with me. Um, my agents have really done a lot to help get me in the room. Um, and just to say, like, for where the cool dads sing, I could not get in that room. Like, I could not get a meeting to save my life. And I, my agent did a very sneaky thing. And she found out the director's email. And I wrote a long, impassioned email to the director like begging her to meet with me. And then she said, yes. And then we had an interview and then I got the job. But it took me a lot of work to, to get there. And then for the Woman King, um, it really wasn't easy either. Um, I had to, you know, it was a process. Um, so the jobs definitely just don't come my way. Um, but like, for example, I've always kind of had a clear idea of the kind of work that I want to do you know I've always in my mind just had a kind of clear trajectory and um you know I really I love shooting movies mainly because I get to collaborate with one director and tell one story as opposed to tv um you know which can you have to work with lots of different people and you know um which is great too but I think my my ultimate goal was always to shoot movies and so my agents you know they talk to me about the kind of films that are coming up and they say, hey, would you be interested in this? And would you be interested in that? And um, I mean, of course, initially, I would shoot anything that I could. You know, I didn't even have that luxury. I'd be like, oh, wait, someone wants to send me a script? Yeah, please, you know, <laughs> whatever. I just, I just want to shoot anything. Sure. Now, you know, very fortunately, like I can say, oh, I'm not really interested in shooting a romantic comedy. You know, I really want to shoot more, you know, a drama or, you know, whatever. And so, yes. You know, so then I'll get a script and um, my approach to interviewing has changed a little bit over the years. Um, I do remember this, you know, it's, it's kind of that thing of like, and I speak to young people like up and coming DPs, like, what is the process? Do you make a book and do you show them your lookbook or do you not? 
you know and um I remember I was I was years ago I was like meeting for a Will Ferrell movie and I had this great interview with the director and then I was like oh here's this book I made and I showed her the book and then she was like no that's not how I see it at all and then that's kind of how the meeting ended and I was like <laughs> okay shit well that that went badly um and so then I got super nervous about making like a lookbook like a pitch deck because I didn't want to have that experience happen again um and so what I've kind of learned to do is um I do always make a book um I think that it's important for the director to see that not only do you know the material really well but that you've had some ideas because you know I think some directors might know very well how they want it to be and some might really you know want you to show some thoughts or ideas and you know they might want to be inspired by you or whatever so I for the most part I will make a book and um you know I like weirdly what I've started to do is I've started to color coordinate my pages um and so I'll like I'll have a green page and a blue page and an orange page and it doesn't necessarily come across as like you know like a colorful thing but somehow it has it has cohesion to it you know it feels more put together in a way um so that's been my approach in order to put the images together and then I don't I make sure that when I get on the zoom call with them I um you know we talk a lot to start off with and then I usually say after we talk quite a long time oh you know I put a couple of images together that I'd love to talk through with you um you know just to sort of bounce ideas off you know what do you think and then we kind of talk about it and we don't necessarily, you know, they might say, oh, I wasn't thinking that or whatever. And, and so it's really more of a way to motivate a conversation. Um, and, you know, for example, when I put the Woman King book together, it was very difficult, A, because I was shooting, you know, where the core dad's sing and I didn't have any time, but also because how could I put a lookbook together for a movie that's set in 1823 in Africa that has never been made before? Yeah. Um, so it was, it was kind of like, you know, I pulled like really strange, bizarre images, but there was a purpose to, to them, but I like had to talk Gina through them. Um, so that's really my approach, you know? And I think it's like, it's good to do because I think having just worked on a movie with my husband, when he was hiring his HODs, I know how important it was for him, for, you know, the designer or whatever to come prepared. And that really helped him and really encouraged him to hire certain people over others because he could see that they were passionate and they had thought about it, you know? So yeah, it's, it's, it's tricky because you don't want to come in with a strong vision and then people say- Not the right one. Yeah, um, but as long as, you know, you have to so just to just to kind of clarify the lookbook are you are you like breaking down scenes and you're like this is what i think for this scene or is your lookbook like a transition this is the feel for the overall movie or you know like you know or are you having like pictures for the overall movie and you're doing like scenes like you know like for example do you do you see a transition i'm just trying to think of something i read i read uh about, no, it's because about the about book about a movie you'd shot um uh one of your earlier movies um oh and the, and yeah the, yeah that, I mean, how, how the visuals changed throughout the film it became something yeah. became angular yeah. you know so, so are you are you are you thinking are your is your lookbook broad strokes and then more macro like scene by scene or you know how, how do you break that down you know well, yeah i mean it's interesting because i know what you're talking about so um so on the truth about emmanuel which was oh wait, um, I watched that yesterday. Yeah, I have got lots of questions about. It. I don't. We've. I don't want this to go on for too long for people. But <laughs> um, so I shot that. That was like, you know, a year or something after I had left AFI. Um, yeah. and when we're at AFI, and I'm sure you know, lots of people know this book. There's a book by Bruce Block called The Visual Storytelling or The Art of Visual Storytelling or something like that. And he breaks down all these chapters and it's very, it's fascinating, but it's like, okay, space, you know, do you have perspective in your frame or do you have like flat space like me, you know, there's like no perspective or um, 
like linear motifs, you know, is, is everything framed horizontally? Are your lines horizontal? Or, you know, do you have a diagonal? Do you dutch the camera because things get tense? You know, these type of things or colors or, so he, he breaks down everything into sort of segments really of how you can adjust the image in order to tell a story with it. And I love that book. And it really, you know, I did two indie movies um, where I really use that book a lot, you know. So for The Truth About Emmanuel, Francesca, the director and I, we like, we broke down the film as sort of like what the level of stress was on our protagonist, you know, like how tense was the scene. And then we would give it a numeric value. And then we would, we decided like visually how do we show those different stages, like the numbers, like if it's at a 10, what does 10 look like? What does one look like? And then I would have a book. I had this binder that I'd be like, okay, what scene are we doing? Oh, okay, it's a number eight. Okay, great. Okay, it's the staircase. Let's, let's frame her on the staircase with the diagonal through it. Mm -hmm. um, and it was funny because it's actually quite subtle, but I definitely use that book as a, as a guide. And then the pretty one, we used a lot of like flat space, which is kind of, you know, you know, there's this movie Clute that Gordon Willis shot, you know, and he uses that a lot, you know, like I think Bruce Block uses Gordon Willis a lot. Um, so that was kind of sort of a stage of my career that I kind of used that stuff. And then I remember I met, I met on this movie Diary of a Teenage Girl um, that Brandon Tross shot and I, and I didn't get the job. And I remember when I was meeting the director, I like talked to her about this and I was like, this is how we should break down the movie. And she was like, no, I don't want to do that. <laughs> that sounds really weird. Um, and then I was like, okay, I might stop doing that now. Um, and so now, yeah, my lookbooks, they're really just more of like, like a tonal piece. I don't really get into the specifics of scenes. Um, it's really more like, you know, like lighting examples or, um, so I think my husband's back to me if you can hear that. Um, <laughs> It's amazing that he's doing that. Um, so, yeah, he knows I did... film, so has it on record that he's vacuuming? <laughs> yeah, it's a tip. Um, so, yeah, I just, I think it's just kind of more like emotion, you know, like a, a vibe of the movie, yeah. you know, because I don't want to get super specific because I don't want to like put people off. But really, you know, I think what I also find fascinating is like I could put a, a frame up and I could see something in it and you could see something completely different in it, which is why it's important to just use it as a conversational piece okay. rather than send it to someone. Um, but you know, it's just, I do examples of framing, of light, of color, but it's all kind of vague, but it's just kind of like, hopefully people will look at it and be like, oh, that's really beautiful. I want my movie to look like that. Yeah, that makes sense. But, um, which is helpful, I think, and to clarify that, but in terms of like, the approach are you like when you actually get onto a movie are you are you are you deciding a visual approach that has an arc to it for example mm -hmm. is, is every film is every film different or like i i used to approach some interviews like i would get like you know this is you know we could shoot you know at a certain moment you know when something bad happens like there was a i often like to reference that i've got a friend called yo yo williams you know yo yes i do yeah. i camera assisted for him on a Minute Maid commercial in Canada once. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I went to film school together. He was the year above me in London. And um, there was a, oh, gosh, I can't remember the film. He did a film, oh, my brain's not working, but it was, it shot on 35. And there was a moment um, where the character, things start to change with his character. And he did a couple of passes and it gets dark in the background around mm -hmm. him. So there was like two passes, like, like two um, passes in the color correct one where it got darker and then one where it stayed the same. So and that, and they, they overlaid them. So, cool. you know, it was really cool, actually. Yeah. Subtle, but it was it was a it was a cool effect. You know, things that, you know, like started closing in on this guy. And yeah. uh, so, I, you know, like I would reference that sometimes and say, you know, at this moment in the film or in the project, this is a bad moment. So this would be a good effect. And I'll, I'll you know, I'll I'll go in with that kind of thought in the back of my mind as opposed to you know, uh, earlier on, I would, I would say, well, I think, you know, well, we're starting off wider because whatever, and we should get closer throughout the film, but, you know, because yeah. we're in the space. So, I mean, are you, so are you, 
do you go into a film with that with the whole story arc visually and how you're going to uh, do things or do you how that changes or is you're just treating each scene with its own merit yeah i mean i think it's interesting um i think it just depends on the movie you know like right. for example on the woman king gina definitely wanted to find rules you know she wanted to be like okay we need to figure out like what the rules for handheld are you know why why are we going handheld at this point why are we you know going on to a techno at this point like what's the you know what's the rule behind it and um you know and so we had loads of conversations about it and like we we kind of came to an understanding about like what the handheld would mean and what it would say and why we would use it and then how we would film the agoji and why we would film them like that and when we would break the rule um and as a director like she felt comfortable doing that. Like that's how she wanted to approach the camera language. And then, um, you know, sometimes it's very much just like a scene dependent thing. You know, it's yeah. like, oh, this scene feels like a handheld scene because, you know, what's going on? Falling apart or blah, blah, blah. Sure. Um, and so, yeah, it just really depends, I think. You know, sometimes those rules and that kind of like um, that arc or that sort of development of the language applies. And sometimes yeah. it's kind of just more free form. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, going back to uh, the truth about Emmanuel. Um, and it's a while ago, so like you were just saying, I don't know how much you're going to remember. But uh, one of the things I noticed, there was a lot of like warm light, you know, like warm edge lights and warm light on on her, on, uh, her face, Emmanuel's face at the beginning. Um, and then some towards the end, and I just don't know whether that I was just seeing that or whether that was a thing, or I don't know if you remember, was that a conscious decision? Yeah, no, I, I remember what you're talking about, but I don't think that was a conscious decision. Yeah. I think that was just, that was just a coincidence. I mean, the one thing about, you know, even though there were so many things about that movie that were very much thought out and planned, the one thing that I sort of, I laugh at when I, when I think back on it is like, you know, lens choice, you know, lens choice has become very much a conscious decision. You know, it's very much a storytelling tool. Yeah. And on the truth about Manuel, I think I had like a primo zoom on and I was just like, okay, yeah, this looks good. Okay, let's just shoot. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, I guess. Yeah, I'm, for speed or whatever, or. Yeah, you know. yeah. there was a, there, but there was something, there was a couple of things though that felt really theatrical about that. Like there was a scene where she's lying in bed and she's looking out the window and it's like completely black behind her. You're looking out through the window. Yes, and uh, she's like backlit. The curtains are backlit, and it's just completely dark behind her. Oh, there was, and there was another moment. There was like a family dinner. Yes, and there was light outside. And the first time you saw it, and then the second time you came back, she she wanted to be the babysitter, and then it was yeah. completely dark out there. It was like, oh, it's dark out there. There's like they're oh. both in the scenes. And I uh, love that you I love that you noticed that. Yeah, like there was definitely a conscious choice of the the dining room scenes. Yeah, like how much light you saw outside initially yeah. and then how we kind of took the light away yeah. um and actually one of my favorite shots of all time is in that movie where like you know there's a dining room scene and you've got all these people talking right the stepmother and the dad what are you going to say is it the one where you track in on, on her face and you yeah. and she's always in the corner and you come around ever so slightly so her fa the background is changing is that yeah the one? yeah it's so it's cool it was just one shot. Why did the dining table push and push and push and push and then you just end up in like an ECU of her face? Yeah. And they really like smooth that out because I remember like we were on this super weird rig in this like location in like Altadena. And, uh, you know, I'm like hanging over it with an O'Connor trying to pan at the right time. And it was so janky and weird. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's what is so fun about that movie is like, you know, again, it was... I mean, it was a million dollars or something, but, you know, we didn't really know. We didn't have the tools. We were just trying to make it. Happen. Uh, it all kind of came together somehow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so what's next for you, do you think, in terms of your 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 career? You know, what do you see? I mean, you, you've ticked a lot of boxes now. I mean, you've done yeah. you've done so many different kinds of things in, as a DP. Um, it's so varied. I mean... What, what's what you know what, what are your you know, what's your goal? well I mean it's interesting because I definitely once I did A Quiet Place 2 I had this like burning desire to go shoot an independent movie I was just like oh, I just want all the like 
you know, the rigging crews and, you know, all these like stunts and all the stuff. I just wanted to like say goodbye to all that for a second and just like work, you know, operate and work with the director and just do something small. And so I just did that with my husband this summer, um, which was really fun. Actually, uh, we went to Minnesota and we shot this movie called Marmalade with 19 days, uh, which is pretty fucking crazy, but it was really fun. Um, so now I've ticked that off the box. Um, I've ticked that box. I don't know, honestly, like I feel a little lost if I'm honest. Um, I, you know, I feel like I'm not sure what I'm gonna do next. You know, I'm like, I'm sure if I read it, it will jump out at me. Sure. Um, yeah. But I'm not really sure. I think, um, I guess I'll just, when I read it, hopefully, you know, it will it will speak to me and then hopefully I will get given a job. So right now I'm just gonna, you know, I'm just chilling and being a mom and shooting some commercials and, nice. you know, I'm doing the hardest job, which is actually, you know, taking care of the kids. <laughs> that is the hardest job. Yeah. But, but incredibly rewarding. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I know. It's the best. It's the best for sure. Yeah. I was speaking to my wife uh, this morning she woke up in the middle of the night and she's there, you know, they're in Sydney right now. And uh, so um, she's been sending me pictures and videos and I feel like, oh, the kids are just growing up. Yeah. I'm missing it. Um, but you sit there and you find yourself looking at the pictures of them or you just sometimes, I mean, the amount of pictures I've created a, fo uh, a folder on my phone, kids sleeping, I'll just go in and I'll take a picture of them sleeping. Um, and I'd like it's just, and I'll just now I don't know if you've got the new iPhone um, app like iOS 16. The, yeah. The screen saver you can select about 50 pictures I think maybe, and uh, then every time you lock the screen and you press it, it, a different picture comes up. So it's like all these different timelines of the kids growing up and my wife and family and my parents and it's like it's so cool. Uh, it's so cool. <laughs> yeah because I mean I don't know about you but I'm useless at like finding the kind time to you know organize the photos into albums. <laughs> There's always that thing I'm like oh yeah I've got to do a photo book oh I've got to do that and I haven't got around to it. So uh, that is amazing that you can do that on your phone. I do have the new phone so I better I better investigate that one. Yeah, I just got the new phone. Um... Uh, for, to play around with the camera yeah uh, pretty cool yeah. One, one thing that um i think we should wrap it up actually in a minute but one thing i remember i was on a job on a job this is not film related at all but it's a parent thing i was i was flying somewhere and i was sitting next to this this woman we was chatting and she was she was the mother of this actress and i i remember that the actress from a tv show called heroes and she was one of the uh the heroes and she was they're on their way to canada to do uh, another tv show and we got chatting away and she said, you know, my kids are much younger then. And she said, if there's one thing that I can share with you as a parent, it would be this. And she goes, I wish I'd done it, but somebody told me about it and it was too late for me at this point. And I said, what is it? What is it? Yeah, she tell said, me. <laughs> she said, well, she said, write a letter to your wife or your husband and to your kids. And she said, this was, a, I've adapted it slightly. She said, write a letter, put it in an envelope, seal it up and put it somewhere don't show them and you know if anything ever happens to you you know if anything ever happens you know whatever there's this there's this you know there's this legacy of notes of you talking directly to your loved ones she yeah. goes i wish i'd done it so i thought i'm gonna do it but i didn't start the handwriting so i've started i started off writing notes and keeping it on my on my notes app and then I created email addresses for the boys. And uh, so I've been every now and again, I'll write an email to them and I'll just, I'll say, hey, Indy or hey, Archer, you know, uh, this happened or I was thinking about this. And, you know, like being away from you guys is hard or like, you know, I'm trying to teach you the right right from wrong. And if you're ever in this anyway, so all these different notes every now and again, and it's, it's, it's so nice. And I feel like hopefully it'll be a nice connection for them to be able to read these when they grow up. And it's just- Oh my God, that's incredible. It's really- I mean, it's, and I've got to tell you when I'm actually doing it. Yeah. There's such a connection that you feel in a different way because you are actually taking the time that you, you don't seem to have in your life to do other stuff, to be with them, even if you're not with them. So it's a really special time. Yeah. So, so oh, that, okay, that is a top tip. <laughs> I got to do that too. It's funny because I know you lost your dad. I lost my dad too. 
oh, I'm a sorry. couple of years ago. And I wish that um, I wish that I'd, you know, people say this too, don't they? Like about filming them or like recording them talk about, you know, their childhood or whatever. And um, you know, I wish I'd done that too. I did it with my I, my mom came over here recently. I did it with her. She was a bit drunk, so she probably would hate it um, <laughs> if I showed it to her. But you know, it's just a nice memory to you know to keep. I, the, the last thing I'll say on that is one of my friends who's just who just lost his dad, but he's he's like um he, he's big in in TV a big production company that he that he has, and um, a few years ago he actually arranged for his dad to be interviewed in a studio by like a professional TV presenter, like some oh, famous wow. And they sat down like, you know, like a night show kind of thing. And he was like, so Jim, you know, and he literally interviewed him. And at the funeral, which unfortunately I couldn't make, but they played this interview amongst a little other video that they that he had put together of his life. And wow. seeing, oh, seeing the person talk about their own, so 100%, I think it's, yeah, yeah I got to film my mum. Yeah. Anyhow. Well, uh, Polly, thanks so much for taking the time today. I'm glad we managed to do this. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's so good to chat with you. you yeah, know? you too. And we've you. been trying for a long time, right? We have. Yeah, we have. Well, good luck uh, in, uh, with motherhood in the meantime. You know, Thank enjoy you. Because, you know, you know, enjoy the peace and calmness. I will. Yeah, before the next year of madness descends upon us. Well, everyone, thanks for tuning in today. Film, another film roundtable. Uh, don't forget to follow us on Instagram. Go to our YouTube page if you want to see the video. Um, we got a Facebook page. Just like us and subscribe and keep to keep watching great uh, interviews with fantastic people like Polly. Uh, we're very lucky to have had her. And um, yeah, thanks again, guys. Thanks, Polly. See you soon. Hope. Yeah. See you soon. Thanks. Yeah.